Uh, we're continuing. This is lesson six, session six, about why we are what we are, which is always interesting anyway. And tonight you're going to find out one reason we are what we are and how, why we made certain choices, I suppose. But uh, to get started on this, let me uh, give you an overview of something. Restoration with unity was a great idea, but didn't quite work out that way. It always, see it took you a while, did it? I, I always love it when, when you have that delayed reaction, anyway. It just didn't work out the way it was supposed to, did it? It was, it was, this is supposed to have brought Christians together around the concept of doing what the New Testament said, and if we all did that, we would all be unified. The problem is it didn't quite get to the ideal. And so as we have, have said over the last few weeks, um, Three things happen that we can tell. One, the concept took shape with people like James O'Kelly and Barton W. Stone and Alexander Campbell. That was the framework. This was the idea. That was the theory. And then they came together and unified. There's not much good of having a unity movement if you have two groups that aren't unified. It it's just doesn't work. But then cracks begin to form. As the cracks begin to form, things begin to come apart. And we're going to start looking at the cracks as they form, form tonight. Um, also, the three cornerstones of restoration, and I'll go through this again for their, because they all have pertinent reasons. Is the Bible enough? Can it stand on its own without supplementation or additions? And that will be a, a key idea, as well as how do you put the church together? Whenever you start trying to put the church together and make it function, you come up with these ideas such as, how do you become a Christian? How do you worship? What do you do this? What do you do with that? And it is the details that create some difficulties at times. And the other is restoration over unity or unity over restoration. As you're going to find out tonight and in coming nights, there is going to be a divide about those two emphases. Which do you put on top of the other? And all three of those, because they are so good, they also have a poison pill in them. First of all, the Bible itself. You come to a point where you have always said, we're going to follow the Bible. And that's good. The problem is, at some point in time, you have to interpret the Bible. And therein lies the problem. Because nobody seems to see it exactly the same way. And uh, there, there are all kinds of things that, that we're going to see that, that both groups would say this is Scripture. But they were no, nowhere alike. But they both claimed it was Scripture. The second is, how do you take a first century church and make it live in modern times? The first century church was born in the, in the Roman Empire at the early days with apostles at their helm. Um, how do you take that and make it function in a place and time that dis doesn't reflect the same place and time? Now, that sounds strange, but you're going to find out why. And then finally, restoration creates decisions which become divisions. If you say, this is the way people become a Christian, and they go, well, I don't think that's it. You no longer have unity, do you? You may have restoration, but you don't have unity. If you say, it doesn't make any difference, we just want to be unified, you don't have restoration. So something's going to have to give someplace in all of that, and that's just one example. So the movements came together, we saw that last, last week, in 1830 on, on New Year's Day, um, they exchanged the right hand of fellowship. And Martin W. Stone and Alexander Campbell's various parts of that came together, and there was a single restoration movement at that point in time. But as Albert Einstein said, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're not. Uh, let that sink in for a moment. In other words, how, how we think it's supposed to work is not how it works. That's true about almost all of life, how it's supposed to work, not necessarily how it works. The problem with it that you get into, especially once they came together, is now that you're together, how do we work together? 
How do you accomplish things when it's bigger than a single congregation? As long as, as there's a single congregation, you can decide what you want to do. But what if you've got brothers and sisters in other congregations and you want to work with them? How does that look? That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? It's only because we've lived through it, I suppose. And so, a little background as we get started. Alexander Campbell, in 1830, put to, put to death the Christian Baptist Journal he had started because it was designed to do one thing. Campbell was one of these guys. Have you ever met people who they just like to stir up trouble? They, they, just, want, they just want to shake everybody up. He liked to shake everybody. He liked everybody to be mad for a while. You know, I, there are people like that. They just want to they hit you with cattle prods all the time. And you go, I don't like that. That's what he did with Christian Baptists. He said, these are our problems. And if you believe this, you need to look at that because I don't think you're following the Bible. And he went through all of this for several years, for seven or eight at least. When they got together, though, he had to do something else. Now, he can't just rattle cages. He's got to try to instruct and guide. And so he comes up with an, a, a new journal called the Millennial Harbinger. Let me explain millennial. Millennial, you can use it one of two ways. He didn't mean it the way people mean it today. Today, there is a theory a Bible interpretation about the end times where Jesus is going to come back to earth, reign for a thousand years in Jerusalem because he didn't finish his job the first time. That's typical millennial, millennial theory. That's not what Campbell thought. What Campbell believed was the church, especially the restoration movement, was ushering in the golden age of the church that had been dormant for so long through all those centuries and been, been, been destroyed, it seems like, been disunified in pieces. And now this was the golden age of the church. This was the millennium, as he would say. And so he published this journal and started in 1830, and it had articles by him. If you publish a journal, you can publish whatever you want. And that's what he did. But he also had in there a section called questions and answers. The problem with questions and answers is people ask questions and you have to answer them. And a lot of those answers are dangerous. We're going to come across some things that um, in the next few weeks about a concept. There was one letter written to him called the Lunenberg Letter in which they asked the question, suppose someone is baptized in a in another way, but they were honest about it, and now they have gotten this, their, their thinking together, would they still be considered Christian if they died? Now, that's, you know, preachers get used to this. You always have the dear brother who comes up to you one day and says, where did Cain get his wife? Chew on that for a moment. Where did Cain get his wife? Did he marry a sister who was not born yet? Where did all those women come from if there's Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, but there's no women? Where did he get, where did he get his wife? If he has kids, and he does have kids, where did he get his wife? You see, there are some questions you don't want to have, an, have, question, have answers to. And so he had questions and answers that would become a forum to where people could discuss things. Now, if you want to read the Millennial Harbinger, if you'll go back to what I call the Old Elders Conference Room, living room, and on a shelf, and that's the whole thing right there, all those bound books, that's every copy of the Millennial Harbinger that has ever been printed. So if you are up to reading 19th century heavily laden prose, then go read it. Uh, he's dense, to say the least, and so it's difficult. But all of the things we're talking about can be verified by going through these, these, uh, these documents. It existed past the Civil War. So from 1830 to about, oh, what was it, probably about 1872, is uh, the Millennial Harbinger was published. 
in that, he made several ideas. The question was beginning to come around, how do, you, do churches cooperate? Can they cooperate? If you have church A over here and church B over here and church C over here, can they get together to do something together, like mission work or something? Could they hire a preacher among them and the preacher go back and forth? Common element in that day and time. If that's the case, but how do they do it? Now, we resolve that pretty easy in our head, don't we? You get together and talk about it. Really? Who calls the meeting? If you believe in congregational autonomy, nobody can call the meeting. Why? Because we're all equal. If you've ever been around a preacher's meeting, I guarantee you one of the things you find out is it doesn't make any difference. Somebody always has a better idea. And so there's this problem. How do you cooperate together? And they begin to try to solve that. Um, but this term is going to become important to us tonight and in the future. So I want to explain it. The concept of a missionary society. A missionary society is a separate organization from a church that takes money in from other churches and they select and supervise missionaries and send them out. Sounds foreign, doesn't it? But we have them today, not in Church of Christ, but in the Southern Baptist Convention, they have something called the International Missions Board. Their organizing statement reads this, the purpose of organizing an efficient and practical plan on which the energies of the whole Baptist denomination throughout America may be elicited, combined, and directed in one sacred effort for sending the word of life to idolatrous lands. If you took out the concept of whole den Baptist denomination, would you agree with that concept? Do you think churches ought to get together and find a way to spread the gospel together? Good. You're at least following me so far. You're fixing to get lost. The problem with that is in, 19, in 1823, in the Christian Baptist, Campbell was emphatic. Absolutely not. Nobody does that. There is no organization beside the church. You can't get anybody together and do that because only the local church can do it. That was his staunch idea. That's important because it's going to shift. And they begin to have fellowship meetings. Now, fellowship meetings are like Christian college lectureships. Preachers and elders get together and basically tell each other how much bigger their churches are than they really are. I've been to my share. Um, and one of those in the Mahoning Association that Campbell belonged to, he began to argue in Millennial Harbinger that, that cooperation was needed and even necessary if we were going to accomplish anything. That there's no way any of those individual churches could ever accomplish anything like mission work, distribution of Bibles, or anything larger than themselves, than administering their own little church, how they could do it without the help of one another. And so he decided he would explore that, and he gave examples of how it was done in the New Testament and how it might be done. And these are some of the passages. Acts chapter 11, verse 22, this is when the church in Jerusalem hears about the success at Antioch, and they need to help them. Get with that. And so they send Barnabas. I have to make the assumption that nobody asked for Barnabas to come. May not be right, but it sure looks like it. They send Barnabas. So you have one church working with another church in some way. There is this passage in Acts chapter 13, which is the beginning of the first missionary journey. It says they selected Saul and Barnabas. When they, the Antioch church had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. This was a cooperative effort. Remember, Barnabas had come from Jerusalem. So now you have two churches, at least, involved in some form of mission work together. Then you have Acts chapter 24. Acts 24, the background of that is Paul has gone throughout the world collecting funds for the poor saints in Jerusalem who have been suffering from a famine. And so he's collected money from all of these churches, and he's going to help another church. 
He said, that proves that you can cooperate. And so they tried to find ways to do it. There's a church in Wellsburg, Pennsylvania, that came up with this model. They had a meeting at the Wellsburg Church, and they tried to find a way to do this. Devils were in the details all the time. And what they came up with, they had all of these churches, like 13 churches, and they, had a tre- they appointed a treasurer to take the money in. And they had a committee of 13 who made determinations of how the money was going to be spent. Which missionaries would go where? Which preachers would preach where? It came up in 1834, but it didn't last very long. It wasn't real palatable for a lot of reasons. One reason was a, there was a competing model. T.M. Henley was a preacher who had known uh, Alexander Campbell for a long time, and he was adamant. He wrote an article in the, in the Millennial Harbinger that said, that is unbiblical to have a separate organization from a local church. And he came up with a model that showed this. You have all these other churches, and they want to send a missionary out. So they send the money to a single church, and those elders of that church oversee the work. Question, which model do we follow today? Okay. You know, uh, Ken knows this because this comes up a lot in missions. Somebody will say, my supporting eldership is that's the Henley model. We've tended to follow the Henley model. Now, if you fast forward about a hundred years, and we, we'll get there eventually, we fought about whether or not you ought to follow this in everything or not, such as radio broadcasting, such as television broadcasting, um, such as homes for the aged, children's homes. We'll get there. That's just to keep you coming back. <clears throat> But we, this, is, this is a critical idea that's still around today. The drive for restoration, remember, it began with this freedom from organization that was not found in the New Testament. Suddenly what it looks like is they're trying to form an organization that looks different than what the New Testament shows. I think it's interesting to find out the thing they tried to break out of is the very thing they're trying to go back to. And that was going to be a problem. And Campbell, though... As time moves on, 1841, he begins to have a series of articles in the Millennial Harbinger called uh, Christian, The Nature of Christian Organization. He argued for the concept, not a cooperation, because he thought that was failing. What he said was, we need to move from cooperation to organization. Two different ideas. They're distinct. He, made, he said there are five reasons to organize. One is if you want to distribute Bibles, you can't do it on a local level. You have to have a central, central uh, publishing house and some way of getting them there. If you want to do foreign missions, none of us can pay for foreign missions. We don't know anything about foreign missions. And so we've got to hire somebody, basically, to do foreign missions for us. Third, he said, if we want to hire ministers, we don't, we don't have enough money and we need to be able to find a way to hire somebody who can go from church to church to church. And how are we going to do that if somebody's not responsible? And he said it would do away with graft on top of it. One of the big problems, I think, of the, that when you go to the Wellsburg model was there were people dipping into the till or they were putting the squeeze on people. I know that appalls you, that people did that. It doesn't appall me as much. When I was a kid, I remember that we had a song leader in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who also counted the money. 
and if he got short, he helped himself. Now, that's a difficult conversation to have with somebody, isn't it? My dad was one of the ones that had to do it, so I remember it quite well. And so that was a problem. How do you deal with the money if nobody's, if you've got one person handling it? And then there are strength in numbers. None of us can do this by ourselves. We have to band together, and that's going to require organization. And in the same article, he said there are a lot of references in the New Testament to geographical groupings. For instance, in Macedonia, you've got the churches of Macedonia, of Philippi and uh, Corinth and uh, Thessalonica. They were all part of a, a geographical area. And surely they got together. Surely they talked to one another. Surely, now he made a lot of assumptions about that, I think. But it showed they had a peculiar relationship with each other based upon their geography. He said the body of Christ is a, is a body and therefore must be organized. He said, you know, the body's organized. If you've got a, your hand has, has various joints that move together and various tendons that make them happen and your wrist can go this way and your shoulder and elbow can do It's all organized to do various things. Uh, <clears throat> But the body is organized in different ways, and I think he wanted to organize it. But then on top of all of that was this last one. The New Testament does not give the details of organization. Therefore, it is a matter of expediency. Oh, that's a dirty word in our fellowship, let me tell you. It is today. You hear the word expediency and people want to run. Campbell brought it up first and said, if you can't find a way to do it, you are basically free to do it as you please. That's expediency. In order to get, accomplish a biblical purpose, you can do whatever you need to do to accomplish it. That's expediency. And he made the argument that it has to be done that way. And so, in 1846 they established the American Christian Bible Society. The way it was done was all the gospel papers exist in time. They put a, a notice that there was going to be this meeting and, and everybody could come and everybody should come and, and uh, some did, some didn't. The purpose, they said, was we're going to distribute Bibles. Remember, there are no Barnes and Nobles or Kindles at that time. You don't just go out and buy a Bible. You have to have somebody print it and distribute it. And so that was their purpose. They appointed David Burnett as the head of the American Christian Bible Society. It was founded in Cincinnati, which will become a hotbed of the restoration in years to come. But it never had widespread brotherhood support. It never worked real well. People really didn't know what it did. It had a lot of moving pieces, but never produced much. And that was always the problem, it seemed. And so in 1849, three years later, Campbell said, we got to fix this thing. And so he called for a new organization. And the problem is that at that time, people began to ask the question, what are you doing? Even uh, Walter Scott, his friend and evangelist in, 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 in partnership, questioned whether or not that was the right thing to do. In fact, he said, who made... Brother Campbell, organizer over us. I told you it was like a Christian college fellowship. That's the same kind of idea. Who made him that? But see, the problem was, how do you get this together? Congregational autonomy has, to, has a problem. How do you elect who, who's, who's representing it? Who's going to call the meeting? Who's going to chair the meeting? Where is it going to be? I got to tell you, when I lived on the Gulf Coast, there were, <clears throat> there were half a dozen churches. I remember we had a preacher's luncheon. Um, there were two churches in Texas, three churches in Texas City, one in Lamarck, um, one in Galveston, one in League City, and one in Dickinson. Okay, there's seven of them, and, and me. There's eight, okay. Eight guys. You think this would be easy, don't you? Where are we going to have lunch on, on the first Monday of the month? Man, we were paralyzed. We could go here, we go here. Well, I like this place. Well, I like this. This doesn't have a room. This doesn't have this. And we're going, who are we going to do? The black church decided we were going to go eat soul food, by the way. 
I never had soul food before. In downtown Texas City, there's a soul food place. There used to be. Um, but that's the problem. How do you make that decision? Which way do you go? The interesting thing about that is in 25 years, Alexander Campbell has made a 180 degree U-turn. And he made it not based upon scripture, but upon his opinion. And so they gathered together and formed the American, Missionary, uh, American Christian Missionary Society, which is still in existence to this day. It was mainly northern churches from Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. And that will become critical next week. If you want Campbell's support, the way you get Campbell's support is you elect him president. But he's not there to be elected president, so they just make him that way. That guarantees his support. After all, it's kind of like the Groucho Marx joke that said, I would never be a member of a club that lets me be a member. <laughs> and this is kind of what they thought. If we make him president, he's going to help us. He, his, he's got clout. It put together, it had 50 officers in it. Um, all the churches in the movement were members. But to participate, you had to contribute. And the more you contributed, the better off your participation was. And um, that's an interesting problem. Suppose you're a little church, you don't have much money, and you can't contribute anything, and they go, well, I'm sorry, your voice doesn't count as much. Perhaps you're in, say, Indianapolis. You're a big church. You give a lot of money. Say, oh, you get 25 votes rather than just one. Here's the problem. They made W.K. Pendleton the chairman. Pendleton was Campbell's son-in-law. Isn't that interesting? His son-in-law presides over a meeting that makes his father-in-law the president. And it's going to be that way for a while. And so the American Christian Missionary Society gets started. And it sends out, as its first missionary, a guy by the name of Dr. Charles Barclay. They read Acts chapter 8, 1 and verse 8, and it says, and, and when the Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria and to the other most parts of the earth. They read that passage and said, maybe we ought to start in Jerusalem. That's how they picked the mission point, by the way. Big problem with Jerusalem. It's under the control of, of the Arabs. It's Islamic. They've forced Christians out, and they'll behead anybody that becomes one. And he gets there, and it's hot, and it's humid, and it doesn't look like rural... Virginia, where he came from, and he lasts three years before he quits. So from 1850 to 1853 is, is their first shot. So Barclay quits. He comes back. He buys a little house in Virginia that had a previous owner. The owner was Thomas Jefferson. His home was Monticello, owned by a Church of Christ missionary. Now, I haven't seen too many missionaries can afford this, frankly. <laughs> and I knew a guy who was a missionary in Egypt who had servants and a limousine. I didn't, I didn't know how that gig came down, I guarantee you. Uh, but the one thing that Barclay is known for at Monticello is he decided he would tear up all of the rose bushes that Jefferson had planted and plant turnips in their place. There's something wrong with that. But, as you can see, there is a progression of what the, the Missionary Society is doing. Later on, they'd send somebody, in 1853, they'd send somebody to Liberia. Why? Because Liberia has been set up to handle the slavery problem. If you can send slaves to Liberia to be free, we're free of them here. Never did work anyway. And besides that, the guy they sent there, he and his son died after three months from jungle fever. And then the next one they sent was to Jamaica. And he was an abolitionist. And that creates some problems, as we're going to see. There was a lot of opposition to the society. Most churches didn't want to participate in it. They didn't like it. It smelled 
wrong the whole time. One of those who was the uh, intense opponent was a man named Jacob Creeth. Creeth knew Campbell back in the 1820s. And he said if Campbell was right in 1823 when he opposed organization, he is wrong now. Now to that, Campbell responded, I was only talking about excess then. The only problem is Creeth got out a copy of the Christian Baptist and showed exactly what he said. And he didn't say anything about excess. He said he had a tendency to become despotic. The, the president ruled the roost. And he did. He also said there was no scriptural evidence to support the society, which is correct. He said it is unscriptural, it is unnecessary, it's un uncalled for. And he called for it to be dis dis uh, abandoned and abolished. And because of that, there were certain churches that started passing resolutions. Um, one of those was in Connellsville, Pennsylvania. Their resolution said this, the church is not a missionary society, but emphatically and preliminary, the missionary society, the one and only one authorized by Jesus Christ is the church. And they complained that the membership was based upon money and they charged it with setting a dangerous precedent as an imp important word, and a departure from the principles of the Restoration Movement. There's a lot of people who are beginning to get upset that things are not working. And the opinion of most was this was not a good thing. There was a lot of opposition. But in the name of unity, they said nothing. They decided to ignore it and hope it would go away. It wasn't. One of the next big opponents was Tolbert Fanning. Tolbert Fanning established the Tennessee Agricultural Society and also established Franklin College. At that time, a preacher training school today is called David Lipscomb University. He was in Nashville. At the beginning, Fanning supported the society. In fact, he was vice president for a while. But a lot of things happened he began to determine that didn't seem to fit the pattern of the New Testament. So <clears throat> he, he said, we've got this group in Tennessee called the Tennessee Cooperation Meeting, and we're co cooperating together, we're, so, we're working pretty good. And so I, I don't think we really need the missionary society if this is working. But what really tore his britches was the Jesse Ferguson affair. Ferguson wrote an editorial that appeared in the Gospel Advocate, and we'll talk about the Gospel Advocate in just a moment, and which he advocated from the passage in, in uh, First Peter about Christ preaching to the spirits in prison. And he advocated is that Christ offers people a second chance after death if they missed it the first time. Now, that's a hard passage anyway. I don't think I'd have written an editorial about it. But he did, and because he was supported by the Tennessee Cooperation Meeting and the furor it created, Campbell lowered the boom on them and said, it's all your fault since you support him. You made this mess. And with that, it destroyed the church in Nashville. It went from 500 members in a year to 57. Suspicious, suspiciously, the church building burned. Probably arson. And it broke Fanning's heart. And so in 1855, he started a little journal called the Gospel Advocate, which is still being printed today. The Gospel Advocate was founded to glorify the church instead of human organizations. He believed that Campbell and his ilk were judgmental. And the graphic advocate was founded to push back against the judgmentalism of his brethren in the north, which will become critical. In it, he wrote these words, does a human organization have the right to usurp, usurp the work of the church? Stirs the pot even more. But as we come to the end of this lesson, 
there are three things I think that you, you see from all of this. The first is how much is a pattern and how much is not. That's always going to be our problem. What's in the pattern? What, what comprises the pattern? Is it uh, when you read that, that they met in an upper room, does that mean we have to build two-story church buildings and we meet upstairs? When Jesus takes the cup and blesses the cup, does that mean you can't have more than one? We'll talk about that in coming days. Um, and so this concept of, remember, is the Bible enough? It is if everybody agrees on what it says. But what if you don't agree? What's in the pattern? What isn't? It's going to be a problem as time progresses. It already has with the missionary society. The second is the issue of expediency will become the wedge of division. It will lead to a lot of things. It's already done the Missionary Society. The next big one on the horizon will be instrumental music. Instrumental music is based upon the fact that it, the instrument is an expedient to singing. And that's the whole argument, basically. And then it gets to be the point, is the expedient necessary or is it simply preferential? Now, we don't think much about this. <clears throat> we ought to, because behind almost everything. The reason you sit in this building tonight, this is an expedient. We got to meet someplace. We could meet outside. How about August? You want to go out there in August? How about in January when it's snowing? You want to go outside then? Oh, no, we're not going to do that. See, it's an expedient. Song books, are they an expedient or not? My previous church, we had this, <clears throat> Hurricane Alicia came through the week I, was, I interviewed for that church. And the church I served had a, they had an outbuilding. It's a trailer. They called it an outbuilding. That's glorification. It was a trailer. And that wind just took it off and threw it into another county. And somehow the insurance company decided that it was worth a lot more than I thought it was. And they paid us $70,000 for this piece of junk. <laughs> so we built an honest-to-goodness fellowship hall that had classrooms in it. And the ladies said, we kind of like a little kitchenette. I had a member come up to me after church and ask this question. Where does it say in the Bible we can have a kitchen in the church building? Now, after a little while, you learn how to answer s silly questions. My answer was, from the same passage, it gives us the right to build the church building in the first place. He went home, and I don't think he's ever stopped scratching his head over that. He never thought about that. I've known people who said you can't put hot water in a church building because that will lead to a kitchen, and that's not in the New Testament. That's all come as ideas of expediency. We have had all kinds of expediency issues over the years, and we'll continue to have them, in fact. So this has raised its head, as Campbell brought it out. The final thing, though, is that one thing you have to realize, I think, from all of this, and from our Bible study as well, is the Bible doesn't give us every answer to every question we have. It's not a question and answer book. It doesn't have an index that says, when do you take the Lord's Supper? Turn to page 75, it says, you take the Lord's Supper on Sundays. Some would say it's Sundays at 10 o'clock. It doesn't tell you what you do if somebody's not there on Sunday morning. Do you offer it Sunday night? And if do, do they only take it or does everybody have to take it? It may sound foreign to you, but I know of churches that struggle with that. It doesn't give you all those answers. Instead, you have to study it. Instead, you have to conscientiously look at it and say, what is it trying to say? What's really being said? And it, when you do that, it'll point you in the right direction, but it won't answer every issue that comes along. Because for every thorny issue, there are two sides, and you have to say, what is the intent of Scripture? And that's one of the things that's the problem. 
Next week, <clears throat> those seeds that were planted in today's lesson will blossom during the Civil War in ways that we have never recovered from. So join me next week. We'll see how the Civil War wasn't very civil.